uh, men dying younger, uh, being lonely, not being able to express their feelings, um, that kind of thing. So I, I think Herb Goldberg was influential. And then what I'm seeing in the decades since is now the emphasis in my observation has shifted to boys and what Warren Farrell calls the, the boy crisis. And an example of that is that uh, around the world, there are more women in universities except in Sub-Saharan Africa. And in the US, it's 60% female in universities. Um, so uh, that's what we're kind of going to explore is how, how in this webinar, how our perceptives, our perspectives on gender equality have transformed through the decades. Um, so um, uh, let's, let's just see who we have here. Could you put in your chat your name and where you're from? Um, put it in the chat. And while you're doing that, um, Jed Diamond is one of the men in the books and he, you could read his um, moonshot project where he's concerned about um, men's physical and mental health and he has his contact if you have any interest in, in getting involved. And also in the chat, I put um, my contact and um, the dates for the generations. So you, you can see that um, it, how Pew Research Institute um, defines what, what generation uh, our speakers are in and what generation that you're in. Okay, so let's see. We have Leonard from Slovenia and Gordon. Um, let's see. So who else? Um, we'll introduce the speakers as they go. Natalie, where are you speak? Where are you from now? Oh, I'm Gordon's daughter. So oh, I'm hi, here Natalie. to um, watch. Good. Listen. Are, are you in Oregon too? Yes. But I'm up in um, northern Oregon. I'm on the Washington border, east of Portland. Okay. Oh. And um, let's see. So I, um, this person here. Um, she's on mute. Okay. Um, Hinda's in Monterey. And well, um, Matali is in San Francisco. Welcome, thank you for, for joining us. Um, so um, Gordon, let's start with you. So even if we don't have the picture of you, let's, let's proceed. So you're, you're our, our silent generation. Um, what, what's your perspective? What have you learned from your uh, years oh. of obtaining wisdom? How do I put the picture up? Share screen. Um, you you just click share screen on the bottom of your uh, of your Zoom. There's like a little green button. Okay. And then you open the picture and then you click on share screen and we should be able to see it. Wrong share screen. <laughs> this is, maybe this is symbolic of the silent generator. <laughs> it might be. Uh, okay. Is. Yay! Did he did it. it. I did. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I don't see it. Well, well we do. There. So go ahead. We got it's it up there, Gordon. Okay. Okay. Good. I was conceived three months before the start of the Second World War. I was born March 8th, 1940 in a, to a lower, up, a lower upper class family and was trained from that very early age to be prepared to kill other men. My dad was in the Army Air Corps in World War II. After the war, he, uh, my dad worked all the time, even sometimes seven days a week. I got to spend very little time with him. I joined the Army when I got trouble in college. 
I was a clerk in the PIO of the Caribbean Command in the Canal Zone. During that time, I ended up sitting in a foxhole during the Berlin Wall crisis with a carbine rifle, a bayonet, and no shells. You can take this. You can uh, take the slide away now. Or do I have to do? You that? have to stop sharing at the yeah, top. Yeah, stop sharing. Up uh, screen. The um, the silent generation is too old and no computers. <laughs> Gordon, if you look at the top of your screen, probably it's green and red, and you can see it says stop sharing in red, likely. Oh, crap. I don't know. I'll leave it up. What the hell? I grew up at, <clears throat> during a time when I was surrounded by professional women. My mother was an RN, but died when I was a year and a half old. Yeah. My dad remarried to have someone to take care of me while he was in the service. She was in charge of hostess training for TWA Worldwide. I started college in 1958 when most women going to elite women's colleges like Wesley and Stephen were getting their MRS degrees as depicted in the movie, Mona Lisa Smile. I got one of those women pregnant my senior year and did the right thing and married her. I went through a divorce in 74 when my former wife wanted me to raise our eight year old daughter. The 62 year old judge had never given a child to a girl, much less, uh, especially a girl to a father. He wanted to disallow my former wife's refusal to custody and postpone the divorce proceedings for another day to determine whether my daughter should be placed in a foster home or with me. Both our lawyers had recommended our daughter go with the mother, but that's when I got political and started Father's Network to gather men who were raising their daughters to talk about how we were doing it differently. A couple of years later, I moved to California, got involved in the California Men's Gathering, then the National Organization for Men Against Sexism, which I co-chaired for two years. I was learning more about and being involved with other sectors of the men's movement and ended up, up de developing the largest website in the world on men's issues in 1996 that continues today. I've watched men's statures uh, steadily decline in the last 50 years as men of working class have struggled with slow, uh, with, um, I just saw my screen change. Yeah, voice and help too. Oh, okay. Okay, good. Um, the, uh, as a, uh, the, I have, uh, as many were, as many working class men have struggled with slow growing incomes, a result of globalization, automation, the decline of labor unions, among other forces, and seeing educational de education devaluing and eliminating training programs in the trades, requiring boys to sit still and be put on Ritalin, men avoiding being elementary school teachers because of the fear of being falsely, uh, falsely charged and seeing 34% of eligible men under 35 declining never to marry and shifting away from higher, higher education where women dominate 60-40 leaving college educated women who would like to get married with fewer options. Many men grew up in a fatherless household and saw friends who lost the options of uh, spending significant time with their children. 71% of total households now are female. Look at headlines like growing share of childless adults in U.S. don't expect to ever have children. The U.S. has world's highest rate of children living in single households and knowing that men die by the 10 leading causes of death. We lead in all 10 leading causes of death. The socialization continues to teach men big boys don't cry and be stoic 
And until that concept changes, well, I hope that concept changes with the concept of boys will be boys. Uh, boys will boys will be who we teach them to be. I hope we start teaching that concept starting in education to be married uh, with pediatrics att att attachments, parenting schools, allowing encouraging men to teach lower grades, be provided protection for false claims and breaking down the social, some industrial restrictions employing, not employing women because they're too risky, uh, but it opens up the world uh, to higher paying jobs like oil, oil riggers, no cat drivers, and many, many occupations and sports where skill and uh, uh, ability determines the employment, not gender. That, I hope that happens. It's taken the women's movement 60 years to get where they are with Gen Z and Alpha already exhibiting more diversity and tolerance than the previous generations. I think that change can happen in a much quicker time. Manufacturing and industrial jobs, oh, period. Thank you. Gordon, what's your web page? What's your largest men's resource page called? I, I put two of them in the, uh, in the chat. Menstuff.org is the largest one, and also uh, zeroattempts.org are my two major ones. Um, Okay, thanks. Natalie, could you just say a word about being mainly raised by a dad rather than a mom? What, what kind of um, influence that was for you? And feel free to say anything, Natalie. <laughs> oh, oh, that's interesting. Um, I think I was just brought up to have almost be more of a tomboy. I, we rode motorcycles. I went, we started go-kart racing and um, played in the woods a lot. We had a creek in the backyard when we were in Kansas City. We did move a lot. Um, we moved out to California when I was about 10 or 11. Um, but uh, he was a great influence. Um, I got out a lot and met a lot of new people all the time when we were moving. And um, yeah, I mean, I used to send him Mother's Day cards also, even when I, <laughs> I would send my mom a, mom's, a Mother's Day card. Um, but I would also think of him, you know, because he really did raise me um, all the time. You know, I spent very little time with my mother. So. What I think is so interesting in Gordon's chapter is that he was comfortable with explaining reproduction and getting your period and deciding when to be sexually active. So he did all those things in a, in a really lovely kind of way. It's, 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 it's really impressive. Yeah, I think I remember too when I, and he's said this before, uh, uh, when I was 15, I started my period at a racetrack. And I was there with my mother um, and I waited until I was with my father to ask for help. So, because I felt like he was more of who brought me up and who that was that safe person to talk to. Yeah, uh, take a, a bow, Gordon. That, that takes a lot of finesse and trust. <laughs> he's bowing. <laughs> Thanks, Natalie. You're welcome. Um, George, you're, you're in the same um, generation. Could you please unmute and add any perspective that you have as silent generation, someone in your 80s, but living wow. in France, add to Gordon, what Gordon said? You gave my secrets away. No fair. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. He's yeah, really Gen Z. I think the most important thing that happened to me was it took me getting into the men's movement to realize how, how bad off so many of my men friends and ultimately the people that I worked with uh, were regarding male role models. 
I had I had something extraordinary. I had a grandfather who lived with us, who was a, a blacksmith and a guy who could fix everything. And he spent all kinds of time with me, showing me how to do stuff. My dad's shop was right in front of the house. And my other grandfather was three blocks down the street and he was a tailor. So I never wore any, uh, any uh, store-bought pants till I was <laughs> going to school. And I have to say that I didn't, I, I was so full of these, it was so normal to have these male role models that, that um, I didn't realize how bad off so many guys were. And still we, until we started our Hidden Valley Center for men and the, the, the movement uh, got on further and further. And it just took my breath away uh, to, to start to get that information. The other thing that happened to me was, um, as you know, I'm an interculturalist for what that's worth. Uh, it, it's, it's about working with people from different cultures. And it was so natural to me because I grew up in this, what used to be called the melting pot, where you only had to walk a block or two to hear people speaking different languages. And my father loved to go fishing on the weekends and he'd take four or five guys with him. He had a little boat and uh, no two guys from the same country. And on the way home, my dad always would take me uh, to a different kind of restaurant. You know, we saw Chinese, Hungarian, Russian, da, 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 da in Cleveland, Ohio, where there were lots of, lots of these things. And my, uh, my dad's motto has stuck with me all my life. And it is, try anything twice. The first time, <laughs> I, the first time might be a fluke, you know? So- My dad uh, told me the same thing. <laughs> what's that? My dad told me the exact same thing. Did he? Oh, good. <laughs> you mean like marriage? You know, my brother somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I, that's 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 the stuff for me in a sense of male role models and the presence of men in my life. And I, I look up on the wall here and I see a photograph of myself at four years old taken by my father. I see my dad and his best buddy in a fishing boat and another photograph and a big, big, big portrait that I bought of Leonard Cohen. And uh, he's given me the other motto in life, which is there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. And so it's a great help to have that kind of attitude that if something's going wrong, it's an opportunity, it's opening up, it's a possibility. Um, well, that's a little bit from me, thank you. Well, just say a word about your, um, your approach to gender roles and social roles in terms of games and the, the games that you offer people? Yeah, well, we've been, uh, we started these games over 30 years ago uh, when uh, the, the uh, diversity movement started in the USA. And uh, we started with doing things like uh, US diversity and then NAFTA, and then we got into gender. And uh, gender has been a popular game all along. And just recently was updated by the youngest generation of uh, graduate students at the University of Dijon on gender and sexual orientation. So we were offering those games uh, on my website, diversity.com. I can put it in, in the chat if you want. But what's really, really uh, uh, important for me right now, I have a colleague who's living with me who came from Kiev. And together we are creating uh, cultural games for like, you know, uh, in Polish and Ukrainian, because that's where the mass of people, asylum seekers have come. So they can understand their cultural roles, their gender roles and how things work across cultures. So this, is, this has been um, an important part of the work. And uh, I think one of the things that, that was really valuable was the realization that when we had our men's center, uh, Hidden Valley Center for Men in California, was that um, we needed to teach men in the ways that they learned, okay? And so we taught relationship skills as we would teach golf skills, you know, what to do, how to hold it, you know, that kind of stuff very directly to the guys. And it was quite successful. Um, we went from where women were saying, oh my God, you're not going to the, the men's thing, are you? 
And, uh, you know, a couple of months later, they say, hey, it's Tuesday night. Don't forget it's your men's meeting, you know, because the women were benefiting from the enhanced ability, appreciation, and um, communication skills that the men had learned. So your, that's a, your partner in the Hidden Valley Center for Men, Phil McCrillis, is one of the speakers on the old video that we did on men's changing roles. So right. He was a priest at that time. Yes, yes. Uh, and actually, Phil was the guy who provided the. Uh, the Hidden Valley Center was where he lived, <laughs> Hidden Valley Road. So we made it, and then we, when then we uh, started using all kinds of other opportunities all around the world, the country, and around the world for this sort of stuff. Our uh, our favorite workshop was uh, Hold Your Hat, um, How to Love an Angry Woman, and uh, this was something that was generated when we first started this because guys were just absolutely bewildered at what was being thrown at them from the women's movement it's, when it was sort of in its adolescence back then. And uh, so we did that and uh, I did them in Germany and uh, in other, other countries as well. Uh, I'm not an expert on France, so I've lived here for 27 years because most of the time I, I was uh, uh, in an airport waiting room <laughs> going someplace. I worked in about 50 some countries over wow. the years. But you can, uh, Malati is on, on there. Malati was uh, working with me back. Maybe she has some very interesting perspectives. Are you still there, Malati? I am. I, I didn't activate my camera because I just finished working out and I'm sweaty. <laughs> oh, so I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not visible. Vis yeah, I'm not able to be seen. But uh, I didn't realize that I was your intern 30 something years ago, which is kind of amazing to me. Uh, and somebody actually spoke over you when you said that phrase from your dad, try everything twice. The first one might be a fluke. And yeah. one of the gentlemen said, does that mean marriage? And so, <laughs> George, I'm actually curious about that and how that has translated into personal romantic primary relationships between men and women. You know what, I'm gonna come back to this in our question and answer section. I, I have it written down and we will come back to it. I wanna make sure our um, panelists, um, we proceed kind of chronologically because I'm, uh, the J on the Myers Briggs. So uh, let's come back to this. Thank you. And Daniel um, is a psychologist, the head of the men's division of APA um, in Northern California, like me. Um, uh, he's, I would say, our funniest person. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> so take it away, Daniel. So. so. First of all, Natalie, I've known your father for 41 years and I've never met you. So a pleasure and it was really super cool to hear what you had to share about him. I have my own stories, which we can share another time. <clears throat> Gordon and I have actually been in a men's group together for 36 years, something like that. That's would be useful to potentially talk about later. Uh, my, my approach is gonna be a little bit different than Gordon's. So I was, as I was sitting and thinking about hmm, how to kind of enter in this territory, what, what popped up to me was as a 68 year old early, like I'm very young for baby boomers. I can feel young in that regard, although 68, not so young, but a story that happened 54 years ago when I was 14 years old, I think is something that is a kind of a dot on the overall screen or pattern of what led me into doing men's work in the first place. So at 14 years old, it's a summer between uh, eighth grade and ninth grade. I'm walking near the high school and I happen to see the, the star athlete of the class walking across the street. And he yells out to me, hey, Ellenberg, you're going out for football, aren't you? And just to unpack that for a moment, it was a moment I dreaded, really, because I knew it was going to happen. Because I, who was a pretty good athlete, was expected to play football. However, I was actually joining 
the band. <laughs> and that was kind of twofold. Now, I played clarinet, not super masculine per se, although maybe it's a little phallic. I wasn't like, thinking of it that way. Uh, but I also really was someone who I was opposed to playing tackle football for two primary reasons. One is I wasn't one of those guys who would like to go horizontal to the ground, period. And two is I didn't like hitting people or being hit, you know, in particular. So those kind of ruled out football for me, not to mention my older brother had injured himself playing high school football, and it's turned out to be a lifelong injury to him. I just think of health as part of your prom scale, that the, when you think about life that there's two, two different parts, many different ways. One is expanding and thriving into new territory. And the other is protection. And protection is related to health. And I was like, I don't want to get hurt, basically. But that led to confronting some aspects of traditional masculinity right there. And so I'm going to share what he said in a, in a moment, but I'm going to tell you that I'm giving you a trigger alert that it wasn't awesome, I, but I want to say it. So I'm going to tell you that if you don't want to hear something that could be dis disturbing to your ears, I suggest you put on your mute or you put your hands over your ears right now. So there's a warning. So, so I said, no, uh, I'm, I'm going out for football. Excuse me, I'm going out for the band. And that, which, and by the way, when I, when I, after I say this, I'll put my hand up that I'm done. So, so he yells out to me, you pussy. Done saying it. And so that's, that's 54 years ago. And I remember it as if it was yesterday. And I think that so many of us have these, these defining moments in life that become like these templates you know, in our brains that lead us in, in particular directions. So that, happened, that happened to influence me to start moving into the territory. Like, that, that's kind of BS about that. And I've been, I had a whole journey, you know, in terms of uh, my own evolution uh, as a man, uh, hopefully transformation and my work with, with thousands of men over the years. But okay, so I'm gonna fast forward 32 years. I'm working on my dissertation, which is about looking at traditionally identified men versus kind of more non-traditionally identified men. I'd say a lot of guys in here and a lot of guys who we've worked with and explored more in the non-traditional territory, but we all have aspects of this because you can't live in this culture without imbibing, uh, absorbing aspects of traditional masculinity ideology based on <clears throat> not showing weakness, not, you know, not crying, you know, not showing any feminine traits, all kinds of et cetera like that, which I'm sure most of us are quite aware of. So I'm writing this dissertation, which in part I'm using a sex role inventory, the, the BEM sex role inventory, which is actually looking at the degree to which people identify with masculinity, femininity, neutrality. Now that's, that's in and of itself, like, you know, assertive masculine trait, you know, tender feminine trait, right? And what was kind of crazy at that time, and this, this was developed in 74, was that mental health was associated with the degree to which males identified with the male role and females identified with the female role. So it would mean on some level that unless you're tough, rough, you know, don't show any weakness, if you if you do that, then you're and you're and it shows on the on the inventory, that means you're like healthy you know, as a male, and the opposite, obviously, for females. Now, that's nuts. You know, it's, it's changed over the years, and certainly different generations are starting to blend more, more androgyny and not quite such tight, prescriptive roles that, that, that we've been, you know, handed down through the millennia. Now, I, I happen to believe that it's really nuts, again, to call anything, any particular trait, or behavior, male versus female. So I'm of the mind that what we really need to do is move beyond designating anything like that as masculine, feminine, and rather that it's actually human, that women can certainly be assertive, indeed aggressive. I have been on the other side of witness quite a lot of female aggression, right? But is that, does that mean they're being masculine? No, it means they're being human. You know, men can be quite tender, you know, and open and vulnerable. 
Does that mean they're being feminine? No, it means they're being human. And as someone who has been, I'd say, pretty much an outlier in terms of showing vulnerability, you know, willingness to cry, I don't, I'm not trying to, but, you know, if, if tears come up in me, I don't stop that. And I can tell you one thing, I never, ever think, gee, now I'm getting in touch with my feminine side. And so I will say that when I hear this, this, this kind of this belief that men need to get in touch with their feminine sides, I think that is terrible branding because I actually think that men need to get in touch with their more vulnerable sides, more open sides, more you know, connecting sides for sure. But I don't see that as feminine or masculine. All right, so I'll, I will pause there knowing that I only have five minutes. I wanna be respectful of that. Well, I just wanted to say that Ben discovered that the most healthy people were not traditionally masculine or feminine scoring, but androgynous. So they could flexibly switch from both. And I, I think she discovered that a long time ago and it's taken a while to filter down to flexibility is the best. And I would say that that was not the original belief that over time she came to believe that. I don't think that's actually how it, how it started. And you can see that as people started looking at this inventory over the years and the culture started changing and she actually came out years later and actually and made that comment, but not when it was originally developed. Interesting. Also, they they were featured, Daryl and Sandra Bem on Ms. Magazine for being an egalitarian couple. And they, they tried to do raise their kids completely um, free from gender roles. Um, I, I include them in my happy marriage book. And it's interesting, of course, that they ended up divorced when the kids were teens. Well, maybe, maybe they need to do it twice. <laughs> well, and then he had a, a, a same-sex lover. So he was going and exploring another part of his psyche. <laughs> But when she, when she she had Alzheimer's and when she chose to commit suicide, she had Daryl be with her in her last moments and, you know, I love you, Daryl. Mm -hmm. So they had a loving relationship. Uh, could you just say a word about what the APA men's division is doing? What are the goals? You're kind of redefining mental health for men. What are you up to? You have no idea how complex a question you just asked. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I am actually the immediate past president of the division. Uh, so I'm not actually the current president you know, of the division. And I, I think sometimes we should pay more attention to words like the word division. That may on some level lead people to be more device, divisive. I think maybe we should call them visions, but that's another matter. You know, so <clears throat> uh, there's a lot of complexity in the division as there is a lot of complexity in the land of gender. And there are people in the division who I would call the, um, the ideologues, you know, who are like the ardent feminists. And I'm not, I'm gonna say I'm for feminism. So I'm, not, I'm not saying that to uh, disparage feminism at all. But there are, there are people there who anytime uh, someone speaks up around kind of like men aren't doing well, the explanation for that is always because of their identification with the male role and that actually it's because of their privilege underlying it that kind of undoes them, which I think is complete BS. You know, and, and so there's, there's just understandings in, in the division that are different than my views. I've been way more of a centrist and I've actually walked in uh, as president elect and then as president into a crazy kind of socio-political war, you know, I would say that is reflective of the larger culture where people are yelling past each other in their little echo chambers or maybe their large echo chambers. You know, and so, there are, there are a lot of people in the division who are more, I'd say, centrist than me that are recognizing that there are ways that uh, male privilege, so-called male privilege, you know, is really questionable, meaning that not to, and I'm not doubting or questioning that, that there is male privilege in a variety of different ways, but I really become deeply curious about what exactly privilege is. You know, like there, the things that, that guys learn to do 
that are really life denying and certainly not health producing. You know, I'm not sure that being constricted and conscripted into a particular role is particularly a sign of privilege versus a sign of survival. You know, needing to fit into a particular role to not be shamed or particularly even violated, you know, because of your uh, showing too much femininity, showing too much open, oh, you, what's wrong with you? So I, re I realize that's a fairly convoluted response to it, but maybe that's reflective of how convoluted my mind uh, feels in relation to some of these dynamics. For me, really, the biggest issue has to do with one's mindset, you know, and not necessarily one's ideology. Uh, they're related, potentially, in some ways. But I find that there are people in my division who are just super dogmatic, you know, like unwilling to have reasonable dialogues. And I will say that I know that you have Warren Farrell on there. Warren's a friend of mine, and Warren is seen as the Antichrist, the enemy uh, by numerous people, the ideologues, I call them, you know, in the division. And as someone who has really tried to help people come together, like my, my, my presidential theme was creating connection and community through courageous conversations. I tried to set up a dialogue between Warren and some of the more ideologically driven people. No one would do it. No one would actually, you know, he's the enemy. We're not gonna talk to him. And I would say like, really? Like, even if you have a better position, why would you not argue in the Greek sense of arguing your different positions? You won't even talk to him. And it's, and it's, it's endlessly frustrating to me. So you, you opened up a can of worms. Well, uh, I, that was one of the things that surprised me the most is people who have the same goal, which is men's mental, physical health, expansive, they have the same goal. So why wouldn't they want to talk to each other? And Warren doesn't want to, in the book, he said, don't call me a men's rights person. I'm for gender equality. I, I know Warren quite well, and I agree. And I, and frankly, I was put in this weird position as, because I get told someone in the division when I was president-elect, even before I was president-elect, that I was friends with him. And then that got around, like, got her. A new president elect is friends with <laughs> Daryl, you know, and so there was like this distrust of me because I was identified, you know, with him. And it was like, really? Like, it's like, so, anyways, this, this has actually been a really a source of suffering for me over a number of years. Uh, yeah, it was, it was for me too, because we all have the same goal and it's, we're stronger if we can work together. But it, it depends, as, as many people say, it depends on how you analyze the problem. So for example, some of these legislative bills, like for example, the one in Florida right now with- Don't the, say gay, yeah. No, not that one. It was, it's really about um, uh, helping boys, and I think boys in school. And you know, there are many people in our division saying, we should support that. But then there are others who are saying, no, because there's some, you know, genesis of it that relates to men's rights in some way that somehow anti-woman, I, I just, and I don't see it that way, but there are people, let's face it, on the, in the men's rights movement that are anti-woman, that are super angry and hostile, you know, to women. And that's, that's not cool either. So it's not supportive of that, but it's also recognizing that there's a huge amount of nuance in, in this territory. And if we don't open to that nuance, we're not paying attention. And we're not going to move forward, and certainly not as quickly as we possibly could. Right. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, Gary Barker has an international perspective, and um, he started Promundo with a friend, and I'm going to spotlight you, um, and has spent many years in Brazil, Brazil, and is now in D.C. Um, so, Gary, you, like George, can give us more of an international perspective. And plus, you're a Gen Z, right? <laughs> I Gen guess X. so. That's X. what the... X. You're X. That's what the birth certificate would put me in that, in that frame. Anyway, it's great to see everybody. I moved in. I was uh, moved inside because it's a little noisy out there. But um, yeah, and, and, and a pleasure to meet 
some of you, Daniel, who have you know seen your work before, so thrilled to be connected. Um, and it was, and it's nice coming in the middle because I got to listen to some of your stories and reflect a little bit. Um, so I was born in 1961, which is the year that the U.S. entered the Vietnam War. Um, we didn't call it that at that moment, but in the coming years, as it became a war, um, that was one piece of the framing of my life. And it's probably not surprising that most of my work on men and masculinities has been around violence and particularly around um, US violence. Uh, whether, so my father uh, was a social worker and um, our dinner table conversations, I've got adopted siblings, foster children who came through our house, some who stayed for a couple of months, some who stayed for years. Mm -hmm. And dinner conversation was about harm done to children, most of that done by men, obviously lots of reasons for that, and never talked about in a simplistic way, but kind of an awareness from the beginning of my father's role model of, um, yeah, just how much it was to think that manhood could be about care, um, and how much that was a contrast to the world outside of my home. Um, Grew up after California, grew up in Houston uh, and in my high school cafeteria, 1977, um, I witnessed a school shooting. Um, it was before we called them such things um, oh. in saying that you, you know, you probably immediately know the sex of the shooter. Um, even those words that we now use where we've made this, you know, just so normal. And among, you know, anyway, I could talk for a long time about that, have talked about it, have had, you know, had some therapy about it. I've talked to lots of other people who have witnessed um, lethal violence in different moments of their lives and have worked a lot with individuals who have witnessed or been part of lethal violence in their lives. Um, for, you know, among other things, watching how we as boys and girls in a high school cafeteria reacted to it, girls crying, seeking help, boys looking at the ground, asking about the caliber of the gun, saying, you know, all the kinds of words that Daniel was just talking about. Um, that was among, you know, many moments of saying, you know, what is up with manhood in America? Um, by family contacts, I ended up working um, in Latin America, worked particularly on issues of street children and children affected by gangs and young men involved in gangs, um, and ended up as a de developmental psychologist looking at what are the pathways of men and boys into violence. Um, and my own personal trajectory and all that was I mostly managed to live outside the US during just about every Republican administration in the last decades. Um, partly by choice and partly just <laughs> the way, you know, life decisions happen. And, you know, what that meant was looking at how the rest of the world looked at this huge production of violence that the US means for the world. Um, there are some things that we can count as good but particularly if you look at, you know, if you look at the US from the Latin American um, point of view, it's hard to see uh, the positive on balance and all the mix of that um, in terms of what our involvement has been in Latin America over these many years. Um, ended up in Brazil, I went to uh, lead a project led, uh, funded by UNICEF on looking at girls ending up in, in sexual exploitation on the streets. And, I kept asking in that study, you know, why aren't we talking to the men? Um, we know the trajectories of girls. We've, you know, we've got the interviews there. We know what leads them to be there. What are we doing about men? Um, and as much the men who pay for sex with underage girls and boys, but what about the men at the bar who don't go and have sex with uh, underage boys and girls, but just kind of sit there and look as their um, as their buddies uh, go about it. Um, so I asked that question in just again and again and again, and with colleagues, particularly feminist colleagues, women's rights activists in Brazil, found a very fertile moment for co-founding an organization to say, we can promote healthy, nonviolent masculinities. Um, had the opportunity to work with some very, you know, folks who are lifelong friends and colleagues. Um, we did some men's groups for ourselves before we started the work. And then um, we sought to do, and I think, you know, what several of us have tried to do, which is bring a bit of a science to the field as well. We designed some of the first um, group education interventions, community-based interventions to engage men and boys as allies in healthy masculinity. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm pleased that those approaches that we tried and evaluated and got others on board have now been used in 30 plus countries and kind of everything we now do 
um, in the US and in many other countries was initially created by young men and young women, mostly from favelas in Rio de Janeiro and then tested in other places. Um, from the Brazil office, Promundo's opened uh, offices and partnerships in several other countries with a, you know, trying to break this notion that somehow we've got, we've got the answers in the US. And in fact, I'm really proud that um, a lot of things we're trying now in the US, which is a newer venture for us, um, have come out of that work in the global south. Um, I'm my my partner of 28 years is Brazilian. We have a binational daughter, um, and I yeah I feel tremendously lucky that um, I've you know just been immersed in a in a bicultural life, um, and I'm held accountable you know on a daily basis by a daughter and a partner. Um, who, as I, you know, try to be consistent in the field of engaging men for better manhood, you know, will often point to their hand and say, hey, we've got your career in our hand <laughs> in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of accountability. And I, um, if, you know, if I, I, Daniel, your comments on, you know, kind of the disgust with the polarization in the field, I absolutely feel that. And, um, certainly in our space of trying to, um, Promundo, in addition to our own work, we're also the co-founder of a global alliance called Men Engage. Um, and I can put the website there. That's about 700 NGOs strong um, of NGOs around the world working on male allyship for gender equality and for healthy masculinity. And our biggest conversation in that has been how to be accountable to not only the women's rights space, but also other social justice movements, particularly around racial justice um, and many others. And I think how to step into that, those dialogues, and I, I, I'm referring again to you, Daniel, because I feel that same kind of disgust with the lack of dialogue around it. Um, and trying to, you know, I'm very, I really like a definition of accountability. Um, I'll have to remember the name and I'll, I'll put the quote in the chat later of a colleague who basically said, what if accountability, if we think of accountability as those of us who hold some kinds of mixtures of power and privilege accountable to those who may have not have some of those, but may have others, but accountable to each other's existence, voice, et cetera. Um, I think in this Me Too moment, accountability has been seen as sort of a call out or a cancel, but what if, um, and, and I'm citing this activist whose name I'll post later, um, what if accountability wasn't scary? What if it was an opportunity to yes. hold each other up to be better humans? Um, and what if it were, you know, an opportunity for love and connection um, to say, you know, we're in this space together um, and we're figuring it out together um, and breaking the gender binary. I think all of us, you know, those, most of us who have said that before, how do we, you know, somehow break the notion that we're fighting um, for a healthy version of masculinity or rather say I'm fighting for a healthy version of humanity and there's, you know, many multiple flavors of it. Um, that's a lot easier to say on a screen with a few close friends <laughs> or colleagues than it is in the political spaces that we're in. Um, so moved to DC when uh, Obama entered the White House because it felt like a very interesting moment to be in this country. <laughs> Um, and didn't necessarily imagine with my binational family, we would have stayed through the Trump years, but um, my Brazilian American daughter, you know, when, when my wife and I were ready to, uh, to look at moving back to Brazil, our daughter said, we don't leave Poppy, we stay and fight. Um, so <laughs> that's, <laughs> I think that's the note that I'll end on. And, um, you know, how, to, how do we stay in this space of, this is complicated stuff to talk about, you know, to, to break down whatever the centuries of patriarchy, to break out of our binary ideas around gender, um, and to find in some way that we can in this space talk both about healthy masculinity and about gender equality. And I guess just one final comment there. We've even been, you know, kind of trouble a little bit. The, um, the, the idea of gender equality, because it, it does too much kind of sound like a pendulum or, that, or a zero sum game. Um, and really in thinking about health and well-being, can we think about how do we help all individuals kind of break beyond gender stereotypes and rigid gender norms and scripts and the rest to be the, you know, kind of the best they can be in their category um, of whatever that is, you know, because even our analysis of how many men are on college campuses, et cetera, it too often says, well, therefore, we should stop what we've been doing with girls and women um, to focus on boys instead of looking at the complexity of our lives. Um, anyway, I'll stop there.
you you use the phrase zero sum game that that's not how it works and i i think that's that's the key that people think well if i'm supportive of women then i'm right anti men or if i'm supportive of men yeah. and i'm anti women and it's as you said it's 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 a complexity um, I, I did a book called Climate Girls Saving Our World, and we've seen in the climate movement and others that young women are more active than young men. And the, the girls that I interviewed, and I mean girls, um, they said in high school, the boys didn't want to be seen as a tree hugger, a climate activist. It wasn't cool. You could be an athlete, you could be in a band or whatever. And that wasn't just in the States. So I'm, I'm wondering what you mentioned that you found ways to involve boys, young men, men. What are those ways? How do you appeal to them to be uh, active and not worry about being uncool? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, I'm sure any of us doing that direct work, we'll talk about the, you know, the importance of finding I mean, a lot of what we've done is, is mapping and finding young men, adult men in the spaces who already wanna talk about these issues. Um, so if I'm doing work in a, you know, if we're doing favela, work in favelas in Rio de Janeiro or partnering to do work in conflict affected uh, Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, we're engaging men in the community who already wanna talk about these issues um, and, find, you know, and, and using their language rather than walking in. Of course, we've got you know, package curricula and, and such, but very much walking in with the, um, you know, with, with men from the setting who already wanna talk about these issues and then looking at ways, because we, we know if we're trying to achieve kind of bigger cultural change, bigger community change, we've got to figure out ways that we scale up. So we're also trying to engage school, um, the health sector is a place where we do lots of fatherhood training, engaging couples when they're expecting a first child. Got a couple of fatherhood training approaches that have been scaled up in a couple of countries at the national level, using the prenatal visit as the way to get in the door. Um, we're working on a curriculum together with Boys and Girls Club of America called Passport to Manhood. Um, and again, the largest after school program in the US. Um, they've got a captive audience. And so using that as an opportunity for those conversations some of our materials were adopted by Brazil's Ministry of Education and made available across the country until Bolsonaro came in um, and kicked those materials out, calling them the gay kit. Um, <laughs> so yeah, just, uh, um, you know, and we can watch DeSantis taking a playbook from things like that, right? Um, so yeah, I think it's trying to find where, where, are, where are men and boys and girls and women, because we're doing this in dialogue with, um, you know, how do we go up from what I think all of us have done moments where we've been in group discussions to get to talk about how was I raised? How did I, you know, how did that manhood go for me and use that as a conversation and a step into how I was raised and then to be aware how I can assist others in kind of deconstructing that as well. But that's, you know, five, 10 people at a time. If we want to do bigger change, that's when we've been thinking a lot about, yeah, health sectors, education sectors, we're doing a lot of work at the moment um, with the Gina Davis Institute on, because they've been looking at how, yeah, on media and how women and girls have been portrayed in media. We've now done, we're now with our third study and engaging some celebrities and Hollywood writers to say, you know, let's scratch our heads a bit and talk about how we're presenting men um, and praise those folks like, you know, the writers at Ted Lasso <laughs> to say, you're doing a damn good job. <laughs> Um, so also to give them, you know, kudos, I got to meet and have lunch recently with one of those writers and said, how did you guys come up with it? And, um, you know, fantastic what you're doing with, you know, go Roy Kent and, um, you know, really, really good job of presenting men's mental health stuff and the variations of men. Um, so yeah, trying to, you know, how do we, how do we kind of turn up the volume on, I think what all of us have been living as individual life trajectories of, there's got to be different ways of being men than some of the ways that we were raised. Um, yeah, but how do we do that in a, in, a, in a kind of bigger political in the sense of not political partisan, but political as in it does have political ramifications of how we organize our lives and power and who has access to what and to acknowledge those bigger spaces, the conversation has to be. Could you put the name of that TV show in the chat that you like? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, this... It segues to a, a really crucial issue is that 
all the autocrats, the Bolsonaro who says masks for COVID are for fairies and Orban in Hungary, and of course, Putin and Xi and Trump, they present themselves in terms of hyper-masculine, like yeah. putting his shirt off, scuba diving, hunting. Um, so it, the masculinity is their key image and denigration of the feminine sissy yep. is, is the opposite of that. So yep. could you say a word about masculinity and autocrats that are Wrecking our world. <laughs> a word, yeah, a word. It's a word. It's bad. It's bad. I, I can think of it of an angry gesture I want to make either with my face or my hands, but we won't yeah. do that. Um, I mean, it. Yeah, it's just such a. I mean, it's such an obvious play. It, you know, I feel like I'm looking at. Uh, I was about to say, I feel like I'm looking at twelve year olds on a playground. But I know lots of 12 year olds who show more empathy and, and self reflection than a lot of autocratic leaders, but it does feel like yeah it does feel. I mean it, it is um, it's it's such an easy way I mean in this country we've got a permanent campaign right if you're a member of Congress you're running for reelection kind of more than you're doing any governing of the country. And I, you know the right wing in many countries has decided that if you play upon that fear and if you take the simplest one that men's livelihoods are threatened. And they are. That's not an you know. And humans' livelihoods are threatened. Um, it, you know, it's such an easy one to appeal to that fear. And I think, yeah, Mark Green's book and you know quite a few others of just how um, there's another one called Gender Threat by Casino. Um, you know, really, really thoughtful analysis of a lot of the data. Jackson's book. Um, so you know, kind of just so obvious how this playbook. I mean, they're using it because it works. Um, they are winning mostly. <laughs> sometimes fair elections, mostly unfair elections, but it does appeal to that, just the kind of simplest fear. Um, and we're not nearly as good on the, you know, progressive or center side of how to calm that fear um, and offer solutions because we use data and we say it's complicated and all that. I think all, you know, I, we probably all would agree on that one. Um, so I, no, there's no way to say a word. I'm sure Boyson and many others here have <laughs> lots to say about this topic, all of us. Um, Okay, thanks. That's a good lead in to Boyson. Um, so Boyson, you're also Gen Z and also, no, what are, what are you? Gen X. I mean, Gen X, I get X yeah. and Z confused, sorry. Okay, you're, you're not quite young enough to be Gen X, <laughs> Gen Z. 51, born in 1971. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, okay, so, um, Tell us, do you want to comment on, on what Gary said before you do your what you had prepared? I, I don't need to comment on what on what Gary said at all, but I, I want to call out a specific line that Gary said that I think is the epitome of Gen X mindset. The best they can be in their category, whatever that is. That sums up Gen X. That's a Gen X mindset. That is absolutely a Gen X mindset. And that's kind of where I'm going to that's where I'm going to go. So I'm going to say, that's me. This little guy in the Oshkosh Bagosh overalls in between my dad's legs. <laughs> and uh, I am one of six boys in a family. This is 19. So this is probably 1976 uh, around that time. And uh, my dad was the town veterinarian. My mother like ran the veterinary hospital and also our gardens and also took care of all the horses and all the other animals that we had and also took care of a growing family of towhead boys um, in upstate rural New York. So I'm just I'll, I just wanted to share that image and then I'm going to go back. So I was born in 71. Gen X is like a transition generation, right? And I think that this plays in gender, this plays in equality, this plays in all of the kind of things that we've touched on. So we went from analog universe to digital universe, from outdoor to indoor, from like the Lone Ranger to Mr. Rogers, hmm. from Mr. Rogers to He-Man and Hulk Hogan and Die Hard. And and then, you know, get a little further and we have Fight Club. So we go from Tyler Durden to 
freaking Ted Lasso as Gary was just talking about. And that sums up Gen X, like from Top Gun to This Is Us. And both, you know, I find it interesting. Rachel Maddow and Tucker Carlson were born within two years of each other. Mm. Right. So that's us. That's Gen X. And the last generation who had who existed in a world that was not completely saturated by advertising directly intended to make us lifelong consumers of products. Cartoons that I watched when I was a kid, starting when I was around 10, they were invented to sell me products as a 10 year old boy. And then Mr. Rod and then I would watch Mr. Rogers. You're okay. Just as you are, your feelings are okay. I like you just the way you are right now go buy a he-man doll <laughs> right that's not what mr rogers was saying but that's the contradiction so gary coming back again and again with like it's complicated it's complicated so we are a generation to live without and this is another huge thing that i see in men's work and in masculinity work the last generation to live without ubiquitous availability of streaming instant pornography. Wow. Like that shift happened when I was, when, you know, I'm 51. So that shift happened when I was in my early twenties, but like pornography went from something that was the hidden stuff in the closets of our father's bedrooms to Likewise. instantly available through download analog to digital homogenous culture for a lot of us white guys uh, growing up i lived in a very homogenous culture when i was a kid to now it's a global heterogeneous you know from hegemonic belief systems to the end of truth like there's a book title from right now right so we have all these wonderful ge generalities and mythologies about Gen X, and I celebrate them along with all my Gen X peers on Facebook about uh, we're tough and we're cynical and we're resilient and we're above it all. And in many ways, like all of that's true. Like I was the kid who got kicked out of the house in the morning and don't come home until the lights are on. Right. Go ride your bike. I was out in upstate New York riding around outside. So all that's true. And we also got wounded by all of those changes. So all of the postmodern uh, ways of being and identities and all the framework started breaking down for us as we were emerging into adulthood and where a lot of us Gen Xers end up is like, holy shit, like this shit's broken. The promises about what it was supposed to be like, their lies, the buckets that we're supposed to exist in. And here's Daniel Ellenberg masculinity, femininity, all these characteristics, all the buckets are bullshit. And yet we're still being sold a con consumer culture that it's like reinforcing those messages in many ways over and over and over and over. So for us underneath that resilient facade, I think that a lot of Gen Xers are still Gen X men. I'm going to speak to specifically we're still trying to internalize and understand the the contradictory messages that we got as the as a generation raised on tv like a latch key That's generation like raised on tv um, it's, that took its toll on me you know i watched from that image that you saw i went through life and then watched my parents get divorced and remarried and divorced and remarried and divorced and remarried my dad's been through this thing five times and like stepbrothers stepsisters moving houses changing things all of the stuff that, that i was supposed to understand and from the perspective of gender equality my mother was the president of the upstate new york <laughs> Um, somebody hmm? needs to go on mute, please. Uh, Jeff, or go on mute, please. Thank you. Um, and so I think that all of that complexity is like the reality, and it's given us a lot of beautiful, Gen X has created an incredible amount of beautiful culture out there, including things like, you know, Ted Lasso and glee and shonda rhimes is another gen xer so there's bridgerton and 
how to get away with murder um, very complex shows this is us like with much more nuanced versions of masculinity much more nuanced versions of equality between men and women and how do we negotiate all of these things and we're confused so in the mankind project what i see is trying to go back and teach men like i like you you're okay just the way you are it's okay <laughs> to have emotions and express them in a healthy way it's okay to have all of these things it's okay to let it be complicated and live with that and i think that's kind of the the gen x for men that's kind of where we're at as gen xers in many ways we want a better world and we're in the complexity of how hard it is um, to not get stuck in simple messaging so if if i'm a man and do the mankind project for a weekend what what's going to happen to me you're going to see other men get uh very real and very messy in emotional stuff and see men uh confront the kinds of wounds that most of us took on when we were younger in an open and welcome way like you're all of who you are is welcome here and for some of us who learn to over emotionalize it's about looking back at some of those traditional traditional masculine things accountability and integrity and and toughness and resilience and like okay how can i embody more of that and for other guys who put on the hard shell and put on the armor when they were young and got stuck in that it's about like cracking open that armor and seeing their soft hearts and seeing seeing uh others not as combatants and enemies and people to compete with but people to collaborate with and work with and connect to vulnerably intimately what what do you find gives a man a courage to do that because that's obviously Pain. scary to go in, in front of a group of people when pain. you haven't done that your whole life pain gives a man the courage to do that my wife is divorcing me i'm lonely what what do you find is the pad what are the patterns those are some of the patterns for sure yeah i was i was told if i did this that i would get this that's bullshit right I was told that if I was tough, I was the dominant male in my family that I would have, you know, family would be good bullshit. You know, we can't dominate our way into healthy marriages and relationships, and we can't use subtle forms of violence, passive aggressive violence or physical violence to get what we want and create the world that we want to live in. So it, think, it seems yeah. to me that the groups like the Mankind Project, Warrior kind of training weekends, those are the largest branch of the men's movements today. Why do you, they're not political, they're about exploring and who you really are. Why do you think there's not a, a bigger political component of these men's exploration groups, we could call them? it's because it's complicated i i see any work i see <laughs> any use work that word though, anymore yeah i see any work looking at gender is political mm. right and see gary nodding right there's a political masculinity is a, a a political uh construction in many ways but if i go at it in that direction if i go at it by saying your masculinity is a political construction Daniel Ellenberg's eyes will roll back into his head <laughs> and he'll start foaming at the mouth. <laughs> I've seen it happen. Um, <laughs> so we can't approach it that. And this is where Gary Barker, the, you know, what are the points of intervention where we can be with men to help them see a different path forward without shaming, blaming, attacking who they are in the world and and what they were taught and their parents it's it is uh an, an act of rebellion to go against the norms that we were taught about what it means to be a man yeah. it's a betrayal to our families and our communities in many ways to go against those messages hmm. so what do you find attracts younger men because i my impression is that these development weekends attract middle-aged men or mid-life crisis kind of a deal. How do you deal with uh, attract 
people in their 20s like Tristan, who we're going to hear from next. D developmental, purpose-driven, bigger picture, I want to be part of something. So that's a millennial message or a Gen, a Gen Z message. Um, I want to feel like what I, I'm part of something that's bigger in the world. And also finding mentors among Gen X and boomers who are not imposing rigid ideas about what it means to be a man onto them, but welcoming them in their full humanity. Can I actually interject on that in a moment for a moment? Like sure. I have a little bit of a uh, thing about this. Um, so Wait, Tristan, in, you're 22? I'm 22. Wow. Uh, and so in terms of like getting people my age to engage with this sort of material, like we've actually, the blueprints are already there. Uh, you see people like Jordan Peterson, you PC people that are actually like generally imposing more rigid roles be on people that are coming to them because they want to be part of something yeah. where and so it's kind of we're they're going in the opposite direction that we want to be going in but that being said the blueprints there is that is that being part of something that helping young men develop as men as humans in these aspects is of actually a very very easy way to get them to engage with the material and you see that with like the massive massive upswell of like youtube anti-feminists in like the mid 2010s like millions and millions of like teenage boys were watching hours and hours of all this anti-feminist content on youtube because it made them feel it in it validated their insecurities it validated that they the, what they were feeling it made it validated all of those things and it turned those things and said the solution to those things is rigid masculinity which is exactly. the exact opposite of where we want to be but like right. the blueprint for getting young men to engage with the material is absolutely already there that's what is Tristan the anti-feminist stuff was like women are bitches or what was the kind of thrust uh it was a very very broad range um you had i don't know if you're familiar with like there was a youtuber who had millions upon millions of subscribers named sargon of akkad who like was kind of the origins of this and then you had it was like basically a bunch of youtubers that um we're basically making response videos and things to a lot of feminist YouTubers and things like that, where they were essentially just making content that I don't really like it's it was such a broad topic that I can't really condense it in like a concise fashion. I don't know if anyone else can kind of explain it in a more concise way than I can, but Morrison, you, you have I'm... teenagers, so you, you know about what's going on on TikTok. And you mentioned in the previous webinar that some of it's pretty ugly in terms of anti-women. Trist, Tristan definitely pointing at that. that. There is that same contingency of, and I'm sure Gary has lots of insight into this as well, that there are some dark shit out there <laughs> on, on Discord servers and threads that and mark green speaks to this really beautifully i can attract you with a sense of power yeah i'm going to give you power and that power is going to be uniting us against a common enemy and it, and there's lots of content that the common enemy is feminists yeah mm -hmm. yeah and, and you know just yeah yeah just to add i mean i think part of why jordan peterson and maybe we could put um, you know, Rogan in the same category of Absolutely. is that they they don't, you know, they don't come into the space with kind of a, you know, foaming and foaming at the mouth anti-feminist take. They come in with what sounds like, you know, pretty clever stuff. I mean, Jordan Peterson cites take a lot of, bed. you know, yeah, Judeo-Christian, you know, kind of in Greek myths and stuff. And it sounds like, oh, yeah, that must be 
academically sound and it sounds pretty good. And he's basically saying, you know, take what's yours. Um, nobody's a victim. It's everybody, you know, pulls themselves up by the bootstraps. And if women are complaining, you know, it's, it's their own choice that they ended up in these relationships after all. And the same with somebody who's a, you know, person of color, you know, no, yeah, racism is over. So it, it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't look like our, you know, Cheeto headed president um, from, you know, from back then, it, it doesn't feel like angry speak for the most part. It feels yeah. like, oh yeah, um, you know, actually they just don't get you and you should just be going for the best for yourselves. And then you peel it away and it is really, really anti-feminist. Um, mm -hmm. It is anti-LGBTI plus, it is anti any racial justice work. It's anti sort of even awareness of how power and privilege work. Um, and that's why it's so scary is that it is not so easy to deconstruct. And another part that was frightening um, is there were there was an attempt by a couple of journalists to write more about Jordan Peterson, but academics because of the fear of taking him on, um, on college campuses that very few academics were willing to speak out against him. Um, so, you know, he, he came out of University of Toronto, um, but folks were just so worried of like how the right wing backlash would come that it really put this sort of dampening effect on not many people wanting to take him on. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, that was maybe more information that we needed. But uh, yeah, that, I mean, Tristan, thanks for bringing that up because you're right, there is a blueprint and we are not nearly as effective as they are. <laughs> Simple solutions, right? It's that cartoon that that we've all seen is like simple solutions, the big line, and then complicated long-term fix. Nobody's going that path. Right? It's a much harder path to walk down. But on the other hand, can't we say that, that principles, morality of equality, kindness, justice, kind of the messages that Jesus taught that supposedly people believe in, in some way that's simple, it's not complex, that I should be kind. Uh, conceptually they're simple sure but you can take all of those yes. things like if you go and look at Jordan Peterson for example he takes all of those ideas and then translates them into incredibly incredibly rigid roles so you're not just because they're conceptually simple it doesn't necessarily mean that they present in simple ways okay um Ooh <laughs> Um, Boyce, and I think you're probably the the only one with teenage kids. So they're 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 young Gen Z. So what what do you see among them, the the teens now? I'm from your network. I bet Tristan's going to identify with this. Much more comfortable in the ambiguity. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. My kids are way more comfortable in ambiguity. Um, stuff that my wife and I both go, <gasps> they're just like, hey, okay, whatever. You know, we're going to roll. We're going to roll with that. And, um, and like they, gender fluidity and that kind of thing. Yes. Both my, yes. Uh, that is the entire world that they're living in right now is, is bent. And going across those borders, jumping back and forth across those borders is a daily occurrence. Um, yeah. And, uh, I, and I also see, as a father of teenagers, rampant, horrifying, destructive mental health crisis raging in schools. And th the number of kids that are, are anxious all the time, depressed, suicidal ideation all of these things also daily occurrence and that scares the hell out of me because even though they're much more comfortable at kind of going between worlds they're also looking out at the world and seeing holy crap the shit's on fire what's the future going to be for me yeah people blame the social media for adolescent anxiety and depression but i think that's only a teeny part of it i think it's that that what's what you said it's like the world is being destroyed the country is divided we have these autocrats that are cruel around the world I mean, there's a lot to be anxious about yes i agree i'm gonna stop talking now okay and um, I, actually i think as an extension to that like part of that is just 
kind of a natural consequence of globalization. It's the natural consequence of the internet where you have all of this information about like, okay, if you are living in the 40s, right? The only information that you have is the information that newspapers and governments choose to give to you. You aren't going to hear about the random murder spree that's going on halfway across the world. You're not going to hear about all of these things. And so with the advent of the internet, you now have an overabundance of information, especially and negative information at that, and virtually no control over that information so that like the lack of control is the anxiety producing factor there oh that's interesting but i mean i could turn off my darn cell phone if i want you can but at the end of the day you're not gonna escape it like the internet is larger than all of us and there's like you, whether it's filtered through other people or filtered through your phone like you're not gonna escape it Okay, Tristan, short of living in a hole. Yeah, sir, Tristan is a ceramic artist. You can see his work on his Facebook page. You can see he's a thoughtful person. He wrote the foreword to Jack Kammer's book about what the, what's the blue sky? Uh, here's the blue sky rebellion. I wrote a foreword to that book when I was a senior in high school. I was 17 at the time. Baby. Okay, Tristan, tell us your story as a Gen Z. So hopefully I can end this on a little bit of a hopeful note, um, because as Boyson was talking about, like I do see a lot of things to be hopeful about within my generation. I do see like a lack of rigidity within gender roles and really in all aspects of life, if we're being honest. Um, I generally kind of see as we kind of progress to a more individualistic society, for lack of a better term, like just in terms of interacting with society, right? More ever than ever, we are interacting with society as individuals rather than as a family unit or as like part of a greater whole. And so I think that as that happens, you are seeing two things within, especially men, but really all people, but especially men within my generation, you see what happens. There's like kind of two ways that people perceive gender roles and one is that is kind of a rebellion against them. And you see that in people being gender fluid and not necessarily identifying with those roles and such. And then you have people who perceive that the lack of gender roles is taking something away from them that those roles are part of their identity and they don't want to let go of them. And so they kind of cling to them with an iron grip. And while I don't think that's the majority of people, it is a significant portion. Um, and those are the people that are supporters of autocrats. Those are the people that cling to people like Jordan Peterson, where like you want to be a part of a greater whole and as such, like it's an interesting thing um as far as the expectations that are placed upon my generation as being a man i think there are a lot of things that have been kind of passed down like the expectation to be stoic and like not express your feelings still very very much present i've had sexual partners that have like asked me to be more open and then when I like it in not specifically in times of crisis but like it just in times generally speaking and I'm like I don't really have anything at this moment to say in terms of like being more open uh and the response that I got to that was good I don't know if I can handle it anyway like and so like that expectation is still very much there. Um, and so 
it is kind of an interesting line to walk where there is still a very clear expectation of what my masculinity should be and versus what I perceive my masculinity to be. And that's been a journey for me since I started adolescence. Like that's been a journey for me to find me being comfortable in my own skin and accepting that all of me is me and it's okay and that my feelings are okay and that just because they're not necessarily accepted by broader society doesn't mean that they're not valid and so that's been an interesting thing in terms of personal growth but also in terms of talking to other men my age um whether that be like in-person friends or like I play games with like people that I only know online and like having those conversations with those people as well. Uh, And so you see a lot of, and that's actually one of the things that I find interesting is most people that I've met are willing to have these conversations and they want to have these conversations. They just don't have the space to do it. And so I have lots and lots of conversations with personal friends, with people online about masculinity and like how they perceive it and like the difficulties that they have with it. And those can be really, really profound conversations. And it's not, those conversations just don't happen because there's not the space for them to happen. Um, Yeah. I um you said something interesting in your chapter that you were sure. maybe in fourth grade when you got the message from your teacher, you know, big boys don't show vulnerability, don't cry, that kind of stuff. So yeah. you were you were really young when you mm-hmm. got that this is what how boys are. Yeah, it was I feel like I was eight or nine. It was a relatively early realization that like, oh, I'm not treated as a child anymore. I'm treated as a young man. And there's a significant difference. That To me, that's what's really amazing is that things haven't changed that much. I mean, on the surface they have, but boys still hear big boys don't cry. Boys who have single mothers here. Now you take good care of your mother. Yep. That, you that, that one, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, we had a little bit of a conversation about that one last time where yeah. the, I have heard the phrase. So my parents got divorced when I was younger. And so when I was not even a teenager whenever we'd go to like family gatherings or house parties or like whatever when we were leaving the thing that I would always hear was take care of your mother and like that's kind of a messed up thing to tell to a (laughs) nine-year-old like (laughs) just because by default I'm the oldest male in the house because I'm so I have two brothers I'm the oldest of the three uh And so I would hear that constantly. And the more that I've thought about that as I've gotten older, it's it's, it's a very, very peculiar thing to tell to a child. Um, Do you see any differences in your brothers, how they're expressing their identity than you? Because they're still in high school, right? Uh, So the middle one is 20. Uh, so there's not a, t- I don't see a ton of difference yeah. in me versus him because we're pretty close in age. Um, the youngest one, we're still kind of finding out because um, he is 13, 13, 14. Wow. Um, and so we're still kind of exploring that. But even like with, I've had some interesting conversations with him in regards to uh once again i i hate to keep bringing him up but like fucking jordan peterson and like all of the youtube uh uh i don't necessarily want to call them anything other than hacks but uh where like those people are 
sig- have significant impact on people of my brother's age and so like I have actually taken it upon myself to have like significant conversations with him regarding those subjects not necessarily to be like hey these people are wrong but just to like hey have you thought about this from this perspective just to like plant that seed of like this isn't the only way that you can think about this there are many many different ways in which you can look at any given subject and it's important to do so because if you maintain a stance from any in in anything if you're thinking about any subject on the planet if you're only looking at it from one perspective you're not looking at it right complexity has kind of been the key word of this discussion (laughs) right yep um could you address the the crisis in mental health? Do you see it around you? And what do you attribute it to? Anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation? Yeah, it's absolutely there. Um, I struggle with lots of mental health issues myself. It's an ongoing thing. Um, but I... I don't know what the solution is, if I'm being honest. I Because the problems that I see causing it are so integral to our society and they're so vast that I don't see any one solution being able to fix it. It's complicated. (laughs) So name those problems, (laughs) like the divisiveness, the climate disaster. Yeah, I think the divisiveness of our political system and just like how we interact with the world is a massive issue. I think that this kind of overarching fear of, I I hate to call it the end of the world, but like Mm. you have lots of like significant conflicts with nuclear powers. You have climate change you have all of these things that are kind of looming over people my age's head where we have no idea where the world is going to be 20 years from now Mm. the world could be the same as it is the world could also be in a nuclear winter like there we just no knowledge of that and i think that is a significant factor um i think that we talked about this a little bit earlier, but the internet and kind of this overabundance of negative information and lack of control is a significant aspect of that. Uh, And that pertains to like things such as school shootings and things, but that also pertains to like the political system where people my age feel very, very disenfranchised with how the political system, especially within the United States, I can't really speak to other countries, but especially within the United States, feel very disenfranchised and like feel that they don't have a voice. Mm -hmm. And so because I think that that lack of voice is a significant factor as well pertaining to, and like this actually presents in some interesting ways where you see like TikToks and things with like almost outright hatred of baby boomers. (laughs) um what was that expression okay boomer yeah exactly um and so like it presents itself in some interesting ways but (laughs) i i think what that ultimately boils down to is they a perception of lack of control and who they perceive as holding control um and so there yeah i think that um Malate raised the question of marriages, serial marriages. What, what are you seeing in terms of um, dating and attitudes towards marriage in your peers? I'm, I'm working on a book about young global feminists. And what strikes me is it's not important. It's not like, you know, boomer girls were raised your wedding's like the most important thing or like Gordon said, you want to get your MRS degree. Um, But, but them, it's like, eh, maybe, maybe not, not important. What do you see? Yeah, I think that's a significant thing. I know a lot of people in relationships my age, it's not a priority. It's not really even like, 
<laughs> saying it's on the back burner would be an overstatement. Um, and so, and then you see a lot of single people my age where it's not even remotely on the radar. It's not of significance at all. Um, personally, I'm in a relationship, but I That's am it. of the mind that I have no desire to get married. Um, basically just because it's a, from my perspective, it's a religious and political institution more than anything else. Like it doesn't actually say anything about the state of my relationship. And so I don't necessarily have any desire to, like one of the things that I've said repeatedly is that I would be totally open to having a wedding, but I don't necessarily want to get married. So like the landmark of marriage in a relationship is something that I could see happening in my life, but the religious and political associations with marriage are not something that I want associated with my relationship. Um, Malate, do you wanna um, unmute and uh, ask your question again or, or comment on what you see? Um, thank you, actually, I think, my comment or my question was misstated. It wasn't specifically about marriage. It was about primary relationship. And, and if I may, one of the things that I've observed, and, and this is probably intentional about this discussion globally, not just with you, Tristan, but the okay. entire discussion for the past hour and 45 minutes is the lack of intersection with non-cisgender masculinity. Sure. And it started to shift, Tristan, when you came in, <laughs> which then makes me realize, oh yeah, this is a generational discussion and the generations were tighter. The generation discussion was tighter and more rigid. The older the people got, the younger the people got, the the more fluid it became. So sure. th throughout this whole thing, I've been back and forth texting, chatting with George Simons about this. And I'm glad to hear because younger generation is one of my topics of interest in my own research. So okay. uh, yeah, I appreciate you making that shift for me. Yeah, of course. Could you say, Malate, could you say, pronounce your name for me and say a little bit about your research in particular? Uh, my name is pronounced Malati. Malati, thank you. Quality, which will be the only time that I will tell folks, if you don't get it, but you can pronounce a very expensive wine, then I know more about you than you intend me to know. <laughs> that. That's my statement on that. And my research, I did a face validity research project uh, about millennials as employees in uh, mid, it was published in 2016. I am not an academic. I am a business woman focusing on the space of DEIB and have been since Whenever we met George, 1990, and uh, so have been have been working, and that's a very broad topic. And so I'm actually driven by my client needs, and it behooves me to have my fingers in a lot of different pies around the that space. But my most my has always been, because my master's degree is on human development throughout the life cycle. And my, my dissertation was about human development about throughout the life cycle, which would be totally obsolete now because human development throughout the life cycle is different. Uh, yet the generational, the generations and the, what I see as one of the final one of the final things in the space of DEIB, one of the final elements that we really need to overcome and really haven't addressed it well globally is 
the non cis person. And, and organizations aren't doing very well. Pol political spaces aren't doing very well. Uh, small clusters of people are doing better at it than others. Hmm. Um, yeah, I can't really, oh, sorry, Gail. No, go ahead. Um, I, I have a very, very limited frame of reference in terms of non-cis men, um, generally speaking. Uh, I know a couple of them and I have listened to their experiences, but um, on, on a broader societal level, I can't necessarily speak to that. Um, but in terms of their experiences and in terms of how they've interacted with masculinity, I think that their experiences are incredibly interesting and somewhat enlightening in terms of masculinity as a whole. Um, because so what, there are two things that, um, trans men who have gone through hormone treatment therapy in particular uh, have said to me over and over and over again, it's that uh, the hair on the inside of my legs is terrible and that I didn't expect me presenting as a man to mean that everyone would ignore me. <laughs> um like just that people don't open the door for you anymore that people like avoid eye contact with you when you're walking down the street that you're perceived as uh not necessarily threatening but certainly not non-threatening um so that was the kind of an interesting conversation that i've had with several of my trans male friends in, in the happy marriage book i included two trans couples and one of the trans men said she can no, I mean, he can no longer go look at a baby in the supermarket. Oh, what a cute baby. Mm -hmm. Can't do that anymore. That's now kind of deviant. Yeah. Um, okay. Jeffer, Hinda, Jerry, Leonard, any questions, comments, observations that you'd like to share? We haven't heard from you yet. Leonard says no. Um, Jeffer, are you there? Jeffrey's in uh, Nairobi, so I would like to hear from him, but I don't know if he... I'm, I'm having some terrible network problems, Gela. Hello. Hi, Jeffrey, we hear you. I'm having some uh, terrible network, huh? so I don't know how long uh, or how stable the network will be. Um, could you say a word about what you're seeing in terms of the conversation about gender in Nairobi? Sure, sure. I can uh, contribute. Uh, thank you, everyone. I'm sorry for coming in late, but uh, something uh, to what Tristan uh, has mentioned a lot. There's a lot of, uh, among the young people in particular, or people within the age groups of between 18 after high school to one's ages of uh, 25 to one's 30, because that's where most of the youths, I would probably say in Africa, they are, that's where they engage with the society for quite some time. I'll, I'll say there is the understanding of what exactly the gender roles uh, and uh, breaking those barriers of what traditionally has been there, of what uh, maybe a man is supposed to do, a woman is supposed to be, a girl or a boy they are supposed to do within the house or within the family unit. So there is breaking of those chains and also you see even parents themselves helping their children to overcome some of these barriers by shifting them away from the traditional ways of how they were doing things to you know the modern ways of uh, uh, how they think or they believe things uh, should be done. Uh, on the issue, issue of uh, 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 gender, uh, uh, fluidity, there is a growing um, number. Like, uh, unfortunately, there's uh, also cases of uh, uh, where people are being killed. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, last week, we lost um, uh, a lady who came out as uh, a lesbian. And uh, according to how some of these societies are, it is very dangerous. So. It's very unfortunate, uh, but it's a talking story now. We hope the law takes its cause 
to be able to at least address some of these issues because there's also that position in terms of how we are fighting it through the society and also uh, part of the people who are in the society because the law currently criminalizes such kind of acts coming out and doing all that. So there is understanding from both sides, but we are saying within the next five years, or to ten, uh, sorry, five to 10 years, Kenya will be different. The laws will be structured differently. How the society engages with the, some of these uh, uh, societal changes will be very different. And uh, I can't wait to see that part of uh, my country because people will be more aware of some of these issues that uh, we have always had at the back of our mind as uh, criminalized or something, but now they are part of us and we need to embrace them. Uh, I hope I didn't uh, speak so much out of the topic for the same, but uh, that's what I would like to say for now, please. Um, could you just say a word about your initiation into manhood experience? Because that was so pivotal for you in, in sure. your life, living in the countryside. Sure. Um, at the age of 11, 12 years, uh, being, I would say, uprooted from your parents, because that's what it is, actually. It's not being ushered into, you know, something ceremonial, though it is ceremonial uh, uh, traditionally. But at the age of 11, 12, where you're, and some cases at the age of nine and 10 years, where you're taken away for one month into the forest, where now that you are, uh, these doctrines are drilled into your head that are with no questions asked. Uh, so it, it changes how you view life, it changes. Uh, and, and we have lost so many of my uh, colleagues now later on to come and realize that that was part of their life where everything changed. Because once you go through that process, there's a lot, your life actually is overturned. All the things that you believed in, you being close to your parents, you being close to your mom, you being close to your aunties, your sisters, uh, your fellow younger brothers, it's never the same. You don't, you're made to see them in a different light. Because you have to, to live this. separately from the family, right? You live in your own yes. little structure yes. and aren't supposed to hang out sure. with with your mom yes yes even uh greeting them becomes now a different thing how you interact with your mother becomes very different you can't hug them anymore you can't uh, when you meet them on the road uh you have to pass them on the left side uh, not how whichever side gives way you have to wait for them you have to bow your hand uh when uh, interacting with your dad but you can't look them into your eyes because it's regarded as disrespectful or you are uh, challenging them. So there are all these things that, uh, you know, as an 11, 12 year old, that you cannot even comprehend why some of these things are, but because of the fear instilled in you, that if you don't do as this, that you're going against this, and then your peers that you are initiated with now comes after you, the discipline that is instilled is also very deadly because uh, people die through this kind of discipline where you're beaten to be able to uh, to, to remove the shame that you're giving to your fellow uh, 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 initiate, uh, initiate mates, that, uh, the guys that you've been initiated with. So it's very brutal, very, I would say, it's very bad for the young boys. And uh, this is now what we are seeing, some of these things now evolving on into these people's lives, and uh, it's very bad. It's very bad. And now we're hoping the culture, some of these things changes, like the way FGM has changed over time because there was the practice uh, before. Though um, now it is changing from now teenagers being uh, initiated or be going and uh, going through FGM at the age of uh, probably the same age of uh, nine to 15 years to now when they are toddlers, when they literally know nothing around them. That's now the kind of FGM that uh, Africa and I would say maybe in my country people are experiencing because that's when now the law will not come after you. And, and it's very bad uh, for some of the things that we experience. So I think some of these things are coming to around after some time and it's really has affected some people. Some people have gotten uh, away with or get gotten through uh, from it, but I hope uh, we can come around it uh, after some time, please. Is male circumcision part of the, the like, traditional ritual as, as well yes yes that's actually the central part of uh, the whole uh, initiation uh, kind of uh, the, the whole initiation is centered around circumcision 
whereby you find um, for the boys, you have to go through the uh, circumcision period, uh, either according to, according to the way your culture is, because there's different cultures how they do the practice. So you find there is uh, our culture, you'll be taken away uh, in the forest for one month. Uh, where food will always be supplied at a certain point time of the day, you can always, you cannot never get out. You can always see the the, the sun through some of the, the the shackles that are you know constructed around you. Uh, uh, and, and then now for the ladies, there was no initial because for the ladies the initiation was through out their lifetime, they're being initiated. But for the boys, it's through that period of time where everything is brought down to that one month whereby you have to take in all these life-changing skills or all these life-changing uh, things that you're being told on by your seniors uh, to be able to do. So yes, circumcision is the center of all the initiations that happens. Mm. Um, yes. does, does anyone else have questions, comments for Jeffer to get a perspective from a different country? Okay. Um, so any of the panelists have uh, questions, comments that they haven't had a chance to voice? Uh, Gail, I do. Great. Gordon Clay here. Um, I am part of the Oregon Alliance to Prevent Suicide. And as uh, we all know, uh, there's been a lot of difficulty with particular youth in uh, the last two years. And in fact, while suicide went down by 2% between uh, 19 and 20, uh, it went down only 3% for men and 8% for women. And I have, uh, I realized that the dominant culture is men. Uh, Seventy-eight percent of the suicides in Oregon are men, and particularly on the first attempt, we very seldom fail uh, because of our intent to die by suicide. But when I pre presented this, and we we just completed a five-year plan for youth, and have developed a second five-year plan, and when asked, I ask the um, the, the Alliance to look at um, uh, boys and young men up to 25. And the reply I got was uh, one perspective is that since suicide prevention and intervention are generally based on dominant culture paradigm, they already have been developed to address the needs at a minimum of white uh, cis boys and men. I totally support uh, looking at tribal community, looking at LGBT, looking at BIPOC, but the main group that die by suicide continually are white men and women, but white men and cis men. And how I pose this to the, the group here, how the, if we never look at that segment of society that is dying, it will continue to be a 2% decrease in suicide, 3% in men and 8% in women. And we never will address the issue, lethal means is not the answer. It is serious intent to die by suicide and it is cis men and white or boys and men. Uh, and um, so anyway, I, 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 I am saddened and frustrated that Oregon makes a statement from the equity lens that it's already been dealt with. We already know how to do that, and we don't. Our suicide rates continue to raise for boys and men, and all boys and men, 
and cis boys and uh, boys, white, cis white boys and men. Um, Daniel, as our psychologist, do you want to speak to Gordon's issue? I may speak to it maybe more as a sociologist than as a psychologist, but some of, some of those. But, I, you know, it, to me, going back to complexity, I think it kind of points to some of the major challenges we have, which is somehow because uh, cisgender or white boys and men have privilege, they, they are not deserving of, they don't need resources, you know, essentially. And so, so much of the energy, you know, on some level, for sure is being breathed into people of color, you know, LGBT, you know, communities. So I'm, I'm, I have no questions about those needs, but I think what happens is in the binarization, I like to make up words, you know, that because these people have been underprivileged, which they have been, then other folks are privileged and, and hence don't need help. But when we actually look at the statistics, it's complete BS. It's actually part of what I'm pointing to in terms of my APA division, that there was this confusion and, and misunderstanding that somehow one, one person's pain means the other person doesn't, one group. And, and, I, and I see this all over the place in terms of legislation. You see this in terms of the White House Council on you know, so-called gender equity, but there's nothing for males. Right. You know, in terms of mental, mental health, physical well-being there. And when you start pushing into that somehow, somehow you are an, you're a men's rights activist. And it's, 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 again, this binary thinking that I don't really know how to overcome. I don't know really how do we kind of address that we're, we're all in this together and we need to pay attention to it. And it kind of reminds me of this this image I, ha I have where these two guys are in the front of this boat and there's a hole in the back of the boat and it says, wow, thank God we're not in the back of the boat. <laughs> like, hello, you're going to go down anyway. I mean, voice and I'd love to hear your position, particularly as it relates to all the work you do with um, M MKP and uh, probably run into this issue quite often. We, we definitely are. And I think that there is, I can, I definitely can go along with what Daniel's saying and I like the take and, and so now let's look at the meta level or the, the mythological archetypal story level of all that. And over 70% of the people who are in those legislations who are making those decisions are cis white heterosexual or cis white men right <laughs> so who's telling the story and what are the underlying belief systems for those cis white boomer men that they're still carrying and and one of them is men are disposable yep. right that is the story that is an archetypal thing that we are still carrying with us and you know as a 51 year old man i own that right i'm still carrying on some level in my deep unconscious beliefs men are disposable wow. i don't really care if men die on some wow. level like there i believe that that's in there for us whether we want to own it or not i think it's a shadow of of right. all of the system and mm -hmm. like i mean i can speak to that as well of like it's still ingrained in society even at my generation like that's not a thing that has just gone away just with no matter how much we've progressed and like how we've progressed as a society like it's still very very much there absolutely how so tristan uh, just, I mean, in the, pretty much the exact same ways in like the lack of care in terms of, uh, I mean, you can go to male suicide, you can go to, uh, male victims of domestic violence that like are incredibly underserved in terms of resources. You can go to, 
I mean, you can go to Ukraine, right, where you have the government that is mandating that all fighting aged men stay in the country, putting them at risk, regardless of whether they have military experience or not. Like, it's all over the place. Yep. Yep. I'd like to share something. Uh, I, I use the word I'm expendable. Move it to your left, Gordon. Yeah. I'm expendable. Gordon, and, do you know how to spell? What? <laughs> it, it, it's around the corner. He's there. Um, but one, one of the things, uh, to Boyson's point, is actually look at who is informing the legislator. It is almost totally female staff when he gives a project or legislation comes up he turns it over to his staff and they get the information and when it is in health services it goes to the departments at least in Oregon within Oregon that are primarily staffed all the way up to leadership by women and so there is, in my opinion, a, a set logic in there that the only way I can get legislation through is to change the medical viewpoint. And I run up against the situation, both at staff level of the legislator and uh, staff levels at uh, the health organizations that they are in the old paradigm of patriarchy has done all the damage and we have to rectify it through other means. I, if I may just jump in, I, if you want to follow this, Gail, I totally understand. I have a different question that I think is related. Go for it. Okay, it's actually uh, to you, Tristan. Yeah, but I want you know okay. I'm, I'm really appreciating you. I think you're super clear, and I'm I'm inspired you know, by you and what you're sharing. So well, thank you. So you know that, and and I'm I'm thinking about really the crisis of connection. You know, is is the broad territory, and I'm thinking about vulnerability as related to connection. Okay. So I'm I, I don't know if you know who Naomi Way is. I do not. She, she is a, a researcher. And what she's done is she has uh, done longitudinal studies over time. She has studied done qualitative research with boys in the New York area. So she's followed them from, I think, like, like four to 16 or something like that. And what she found, which is really fascinating, I think her book is called Deep Secrets. Actually, I feel emotional with this because it, it touches me so much that these little boys, when they're younger, are actually quite vulnerable. They share more, you know, with their friends, they, and they actually have more connections. And around the age of, you know, seven, eight, nine, I think what's happened is they've internalized the boy box, which eventually becomes the man box about you shouldn't show vulnerability, don't let them see you sweat, don't. So they learn somehow that. They're uncool, you know, if they share more of their vulnerability. So what happens is they start kind of like armoring, armoring up, you know, what you know, Wilhelm Reich, you know, we call it this body armor, psychic armor. And then they, I don't even know, no. And and when they're interviewed, they say, Yeah, I used to be, you know, really connected with Jose or John or whoever, but you know, we've just gotten more distant over time. And I don't not as close with my friends, but that's that's okay. Cool, man. It's, it doesn't matter. And they know, say no uh, homo if they do. No homo. no homo. And and so this homo homophobia, craziness that goes on, and the vulnerability of loving your friends, you know, like uh, it's so painful to me. Like like love, loving your male friends means you're gay, and being gay is you're bad. It's, it's, it's still this stigma. You know, there. And I'm just curious for you, Tristan, what you've noticed in terms of guys in particular your age, younger, sharing vulnerabilities, you know, with each other. And 
and you, you see a difference or it's, it's, it changes over as they get older. So I actually have kind of an interesting perspective on this because I'm bisexual. Um, and so as someone who has had relationships with both men and women, it's been an interesting experience for me to kind of navigate what we're talking about here. Uh, and so what I see from a lot of my straight friends is that the fear of looking gay comes from their perceived uh, chances at straight relationships, um, which sounds kind of weird, but what happens that I see is that they don't want to look gay in front of women. Mm. It's not that they don't want to look gay in front of other men, because if you, uh, with, if it's just a group of boys, they, like, all bets are off. It's all fine. But if there is a singular girl there, all of the dynamics change. And so it's a fear of looking gay in front of women and losing out on a potential relationship there, whether there's actually like an attraction there or not. It's just ingrained into their psyche of, I don't want to look gay in front of women because that will ruin my chances at a relationship with them. Interesting. Wow. <laughs> but you've, you've, you said in your chapter, Tristan, that you felt like communication between men was more direct, less convoluted, less manipulative, um, easier. In a I way. don't know that necessarily in the less manipulative, but... Uh, I think that it is generally more direct, um, but that being said, that doesn't necessarily, uh, uh, we'll put it this way. It's incredibly direct in a vacuum when nobody else is watching. Just the two people. Nice. Yeah. Can I complicate that just a tiny bit? Of course, Tristan, please. Based on That's a experience. forbidden word. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that. I love it. Um, I don't want to get it twisted with masculinity as man and femininity as woman either. Yes. I, don't, I, don't twist it because, you know, I picked up my 15-year-old from school yesterday and their best friend was out in the field and Jay rolls down the window. Jay uses they, them pronouns. And what does Jay yell to their best friend in the world? You suck. I love you. <laughs> That's pretty direct. That's it, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that I think is, there's a directness about that conversation. And yeah, and that's what I wanna get. So the legislator, I, I just have to circle back to say, that the legislators and their staffs, regardless of whether their staffs are men and women, it's patriarchal hegemonic thinking that's informing the thing. Like there are lots of female legislators yeah, out there right. right now legislating, legislating against women's bodies. Yes. Yeah. But it's the frame that they've bought into. It's not man, woman. It's not masculine, yeah. feminine. It's the framework, the whole thing. So yes. Wouldn't right. surprise me. Yeah. Daniel, you look like you want to say something. Well, I'm going to, I have to get going. So to, but, to move on to my next thing. So thank you, Gail. Thank you, everyone. Oh, thank you. Um, before we leave, George, could you um, say a word about uh, Marie La Pen and her pretty close showing in the recent election? Uh, so she, she loves Putin. She's kind of making the point that uh, women buy into the patriarchal system. Why, why, did, why is she so popular now? Well, I, a theme that's been running through my head, by the way, I've really appreciated listening into this conversation. I think I've learned a awful lot today. Uh, but the, the thing that's been running through my mind here is that 
Um, as an interculturalist, one of the basic principles, which is now being reinforced strongly by what we're learning about neuroscience, is that in times of stress, we move back to older cultural conversations oh, as that's... more secure. And this is an automatic process. Okay, so up the stress, and you're going to hear the more conservative, protect yourself uh, kinds of uh, discourse. I mean, I'm, I don't think Macron's the greatest guy in the world, but I, I'm sure happy that he won, you know. Um, and this is, uh, uh, but, but the, 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 uh, the thing that's going on right now is really a question about the, in, the entire viability of the party system in France. And I don't want to go deeply into that, but I just want to say that to me, again and again, in the things I've been hearing today and in the Le Pen story, is this fact that under stress, increase the stress, and we go back to primitive conversations mm -hmm. about who we are as men, as women, and so on. So I'm not at all surprised about this dynamic. It's a well-established dynamic. And what we need to do, I mean, that's what I'm trying to do with my life here, what's left of it, is create the conversations where people can get their mirror neurons reflecting each other in such a way that they can talk at deeper and deeper levels. Um, I won't go any further with that, but I, the point I wanted to make was exactly this, that you know what we're seeing under stress. I, I've had... <laughs> Malati was early in the game here, but I've had 64 interns over the years from 23 different countries. And what I've noticed in the, I, I mean, to, just to back up what I've heard about the younger generation here is that the uncertainty is utterly incredible. But, you know, the, 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 uh, the what do I want to say, the the uh, dogmatic view of masculinity and femininity has somehow been fragmented to a great degree. And not, not just because of people being of different uh, sexual orientations, but, but the, 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 I, I think the, one, of the things that, one of the things that strikes me again and again is that I run into young people who say, I don't have any background, I don't have any culture, I've lived here, 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 and here. And what we're looking at is people who are in denial and in pain about their, 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 their uh, cultural upbringing, their cultural shape, and so on. So uh, these are, these are you know, just from an interculturalist perspective, a lot of this stuff makes sense by the desperation created by stress and the unwillingness to face uh, more complex issues. That's mm -hmm. enough. Oh no, that makes sense. Um, yeah, um, anyone else have question, comment, observation? Um, thank you very much to everyone for sharing your views. I think we all learned a lot as George said, I love you all and um, we will Just be in touch. Comment, you Please. Know? Um, one, one more word, one more word. Gordon, it's great to see you. I, everybody in the hospital, when I was in the hospital, asked me, was I from Norway or where did I get that hat? He <laughs> sent me one and good guys <laughs> send hats to each other. <laughs> Hood and flowers River. and all kinds of good stuff. Hood River, Oregon. And that's where my daughter lives. And I wanted to say one point is that uh, I never missed having a son. I never raised my daughter because I was missing and wanting a boy. I raised my daughter to do the things that I'm good at, that I know something about and shared with her. And I, one final point is I wanna acknowledge her because when she was 20 or 21, she took on a, a co-facilitating a workshop that I did within Mankind Project called Father and Teenage Daughter Rites of Passage. 
and she co-facilitated that with the girls and I took the fathers. We did it in Chicago and we did it in Grass Valley and all, and she was phenomenal at it at such a young age. So I, I wanted to uh, acknowledge her and our relationship. Great, that's a good note to end on. Fathers rock. Bye everyone, keep in touch. Thanks everybody.